both time and money in waxing floors, use economical no-rubbing Aero Wax. Just apply it, and in six to nine minutes, it dries itself to a hard, lustrous finish that saves countless scrubbing. Makes dingy floors shine like new, yet Aero Wax costs only 25 cents a pint. Try Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, would you like to have an attractive, dazzling smile, teeth that sparkle with all their natural brilliance? Then try the new Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Colonos acts like a jewelless polish in removing tarnish from silver, erasing the common surface stains and dingy film that so often robs you of an attractive smile. See the difference it makes in the appearance of your teeth. Try Colonos toothpaste. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S tonight. <laughs> Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. Our story this time opens far from Mr. Keene's comfortable office in New York. On a stormy night in the deep south. A night lashed by wind and rain. The ramshackle old cab makes its way up a back road. Over his shoulder, the old Negro driver talks to his two passengers. Mr. Keene and the latter's assistant, Mike Clancy. So y'all want me to drop you off at the Mead place? Yes, driver. That's what I said. Will we soon be there? In hardly a minute, boss. Wouldn't get me to go visiting in there at night. And why not? Most unnatural folks in there. Crazy folks. Saints preserve us. All touched in the head and the heart. Why do you say that? You'll meet them, boss. Here you are, gentlemen. This gate right over here. Hmm. Quite a big place. All walled in. I'll get out and ring the bell for you. Thank you. And I'll wait here till someone comes for the fetcher. But I ain't going inside. Driver, you wouldn't be superstitious, eh? Oh, no, no, sir. Just intelligent. I'm very intelligent about places where not to go. <laughs> oh, Mr. King, I, uh... I just remembered something terribly important. What's that, Mike? Well, I got an appointment tonight to go bowling in New York. Oh. Oh. Steady, Mike. <coughs> there comes somebody now. Oh, it's a great game. Big as a horse. And a woman with him. She's unlocking the gate. Come on, Mike. Let's get out. On your responsibility, sir. Driver, I uh, believe this covers the fare. Thank you, sir. And uh, good luck to you. Good evening. I uh, suppose you're Mr. King. Yes. This is my assistant, Mike Clancy. I'm Dorothy Mead. How do you do? How do you do? Please, Please come in. Sorry you had to make the trip in such weather, Mr. King. Not at all. I'm much more troubled by what you had to say in your letter, Miss Mead. Yes, it's so disturbing about Uncle Adam. Let's walk along the driveway, shall we? We'll get some shelter from the trees. Well, these are uh, water oaks, I believe. Mm -hmm. Twelve altogether in a double row. They're magnificent. Yes, but they've been going to pieces lately. There's the house on up ahead. Oh, yes. Well, that's one of the most beautiful and majestic southern mansions I've ever seen. But decaying. Like everything else around here. Oh, be careful of that first step, Mr. King. It's loose. I have it. Just a minute. 
Let's fasten Nero's leash to the post here. Please come inside. And uh, just to hang your coat and hat from those hooks there. Thank you. Ah, it's good to be in out of the rain. Well, if you'll come across the hall now, we'll make ourselves comfortable in the library. Stop where you are. Saints preserve us. Turn around. Get out of this house. It's that man. The top of the stairs. You're not wanted here. Get out. Oh, now stop it, Cousin Roscoe. You're being very rude. I don't like strangers. I hate them. Go on back to your room, dear. And work on your plan. Otherwise, you'll never capture Washington. Ah, yes. Washington. I'll move up reinforcements to the Army of the Potomac. Dorothea, see that I am not disturbed. Glory be. Poor Roscoe is still fighting the war of the States, Mr. King. So it would seem. Here, let's go into the library. Of course. Now, if you just make yourselves comfortable. Well, now, Miss Dorothea, to get a few facts straight, this place belongs to your Uncle Adam? Yes, Mr. King. How old is he? About 80. And he disappeared just 10 days ago? That's right. That's why I want you to investigate. Well, now... Who are all the members of the household? Well, I myself, I'm just visiting here. Then there are two nephews and another niece. Oh. You've just met one of the nephews, my cousin Roscoe. Huh. I'd say. Yeah. Then there's also Roscoe's sister, Harriet. Both about 50. Yes. Finally, there's my cousin, Herbert Mead. About 40, very charming. He lived for years in India. Oh, did he? Came back last year with wonderful gifts for all of us. I believe he's enormously wealthy. At any rate, that was the entire household except for the servant. Your uncle and two nieces and two nephews. Yes. Now, tell me about the exact circumstance of his disappearance, Miss Dorothea. Well, after dinner that night, Uncle Adam decided to go for a walk. It was very dark, moonless, but quite mild. He went by himself? No, Nero trotted off with him, Mr. King. Mm-hmm. Who was the last person to see him? Oh, well, I was. I went out after him to offer him a flashlight. He said... Nonsense, my dear. I don't need it. Oh, but it's so awfully dark, Uncle Adam. I know every pebble around here by its first name. Uh, come along, Nero. Let's go get some air. <coughs> and that was the last time you saw him, eh? What about Nero? We found Nero here the next morning tied to a post. Well, we presumed that Uncle Adam had decided not to take him after all, or disappeared after returning. Did you start a search for him? The very next morning, Mr. King. Well, the police went all over the grounds and no trace of him. Then I decided to write to you. Oh, I'm so terribly worried. What could have happened to him, Mr. King? It's much too early to start guessing, my dear. Miss Dorothea, quite frankly, how did your uncle get along with the other members of the household? Well, I, he was something of a tea. You see it. Oh, hello, Cousin Herbert. Hello, Dorothy. I understand Mr. Keene has arrived. Yes, and this is his assistant, Mr. Clancy. How do you How do? You do? do? This is a dreadful business. If there's any way I can help, Mr. Keene... I may want to talk to you later, Mr. Mead. Well, I'll be in my room. Delighted to have met you, Mr. Keene. Seems like a very pleasant sort. Oh, he's a dear. And about the only one that Uncle Adam never picked on... Of course, Uncle Adam's been supporting Roscoe and Harriet for years as permanent guests. But he could never let off reminding Harriet about her age. He says, Harriet, my dear niece, sometimes I begin to think you'll never find a husband. He's still Uncle Adam. I must admit, though, that I met a fellow the other day who's quite smitten with you, Harriet. Oh, oh, really? Did you? Uh, Miss Harriet, he said, isn't the flashy kind. But for solid, good looks, she can't be beat. Oh, tell me. Who said that? Oh, a fellow in the old man's home. <laughs> I hate you, Uncle Adam. I hate you. That wasn't very kind. Oh, but in money matters, he was the very soul of generosity. Here, look. Inside the drawer of this table, Mr. Keith. Hmm. It's stuffed with bills. It was there for Roscoe and Harriet to use if they wished. Interesting. Boss, there's something very odd about the size of those bills. Yes, this is the old-fashioned currency, Mike. 
About 50% larger than what's issued nowadays. That's one of my uncle's eccentricities. He's kept a bale of cash in the bank vault for years, and he's still drawing on it. I see. Well, now, Miss Dorothea, besides the servants, was there anybody else around the grounds about the time he disappeared? Well, yes. Uncle Adam had hired three or four men to work on the oaks. That double row we saw as we came in, eh? Yes. And I can get you the names of all the men who work here. Well, that can wait until morning. Oh, yes, of course. Let me show you to your room now. Here you are, Mr. King. Your room, Mr. Clancy, is the one down the hall there. Well, thank you, Miss Dorothea. I'll be one to talk a minute with the boss. I'll find it later. Everything's all laid out for you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Boss, what do you make of it? Nothing yet. Oh, this place gives me the creeps. Oh, relax, Michael. Oh, I get the feeling that eyes are on me all the time. And then that darn rainstorm. Oh, I, I wish she hadn't put us off in this lonely old wing by ourselves. Steady, Mike. Go to sleep. Well, I'll try to anyhow. Good night, boss. Good night. <sighs> Almost 11 o'clock. It is a strange house. And a strange family. I wonder if that storm will clear by morning. Must have a look around the grounds as soon as possible. See if... Oh, great Scott. It's Mike Clancy. Somebody's turned off the hall light. One moment, Mike, while I find the hall light. Ah, there you are. Lying in the floor. Wait, Mike, wait. I'll fasten it from your neck. Uh, there we are. Oh, stands for us. What was it? A silk stocking drawn around your neck like a noose. Glory be. Tell me, what happened? I don't know, boss. I, I stepped out into the hall. I started from the own room. Suddenly the light went out and I was being choked. With a silk stocking? Oh, there are no better use for silk stockings in times like these. One second. You notice anything about the color of this? Well, it, it's it's dark, sort of. Gunmetal. The same color that Dorothea Mead was wearing. Oh, boss, I I told you I should have went bowling tonight in little old New York. Good morning, Mr. Key. Good morning. You enjoying your view from the porch? Yes, it's beautiful. Thank heavens the storm has cleared. Yes, it gave me the chance to look around the ground. Oh, did you find anything interesting? Mm -hmm. But on Mr. Clancy's neck, look at this. A oh, stocking? Well, it looks like one of my own. It was used last night in an attempt to choke Mr. Clancy. Oh, Oh, dear God. I wonder if you can explain. Well, I, I'm afraid that I can. I I have several pairs like that. When I went back to my room last night, Roscoe was coming out. Oh, was he? He said he'd been looking for some book. And, oh, I know he has fits of temper, but I hate to believe he actually would try. Here he comes now, up the gravel path. Ah, is that you, Keen? Just the man I want to see. Good. I want to talk with you. Tell me, Keen. If you were in a situation where your major forces were disposed along the Potomac and Grant was moving along your flank... Now, Mr. Meade. Oh, 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 you think I'm a bit of a fool, don't you? Well, look at these. Dollar bills? A dozen of them. The old-fashioned size. I've been investigating for a week, all on my own. You know where they all turned up? In the bar back in town. The bartender told me. I have bought them all up. Know why? Well, why? Because they'd all been spent there by Ben Matley. Oh, who's he? He's one of the men working on the ground when my uncle disappeared. Simple as could be. Matley murdered Uncle Adam. Well, that's very much worth looking into. But what about this stocking, Mr. Mead? Ever see it before? Have you? Of course. On Dorothea's leg. <laughs> one moment, Mr. Mead. I'm afraid I'll have to go after him. 
give this to me. Stop where you are. Mr. Keene, uh, this is Cousin Harriet. I don't want this man here. Tell him to leave Roscoe alone. Cousin Harriet, if we're ever to find Uncle Adam. Why, Jim, I don't much care if we do. <laughs> This seems to be a house of hate with motives on every side. But Mr. Keene continues his search. Meanwhile, thousands of girls who suffer the heartache of being unpopular, clever, pretty, smartly dressed girls have just one thing to blame. Teeth that rob them of charm when they smile. Thousands of men whose livelihood depends on selling themselves to others have the same weakness of appearance to blame. They don't know it or notice it, but the people they contact do. You may or may not be one of those people, but if you have the slightest suspicion that you are, try the new Colonos toothpaste, a high-polishing toothpaste. Its action is like a jeweler's polish removing tarnish from a piece of silver. You'll find Colonos helps remove those dingy, unattractive surface stains from your teeth, brings out all the natural luster and brilliance that adds so much to your smile. Start using the new Colonos tonight. Remember, it's a high-polishing toothpaste. You can get Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonos toothpaste at any drugstore. Now back to Mr. Keene, who is knocking on the door of a cottage near the Mead Estate. Good morning. Are you Ben Matley? Sure enough. Keene is my name. Yeah. I heard they was calling you from New York to find old Mr. Adam Mead. Well, Metley, I'm going to ask you a very blunt question. Yeah? How do you come to have so many of those large-sized bills that Mr. Adam Mead always used? Heck, I worked for him for weeks on them trees. You would seem to be spending more than your normal share. Sure. I'm good at poker, and the other boys ain't. Well, tell me, Matley, about the work you did in those water oaks. Now, I gather that it consisted of hollowing out the rotted parts and filling them with cement. Yeah, sure enough. And then, were they finished? Yep. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago today. Before Mr. Mead disappeared? Mm. The day before. Oh. Uh, sure had big holes in them. Funny the way that rot gets in water oaks. Holes big as a house, Mr. Keene. Hmm. But it never affects black walnut trees that way, does it? Hardly ever. What do you ask me for? Why? For an excellent reason. Mr. Keene. Good, Miss Dorothea. I've worked up quite an appetite with all my walking this morning. Not right this way. The others are all waiting. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, Mr. Clancy's sitting here by my side. Will you sit next to Cousin Herbert, Mr. Keene? Delighted. Any progress, Mr. Keene? Progress? Why, I believe... That... Excuse me. Oh, did you drop something on the floor? I... Got a pebble in my shoe. I'll have it out in a moment. <laughs> Ah, there we are. You were saying, Mr. Keene. Negative progress. I mean that we can safely eliminate one theory. And what is that? If your uncle has been murdered, Miss Harriet, I don't believe it was for a legacy. Why do you say that, Mr. Keene? Because, Miss Dorothea, he has been made to disappear so completely. I don't follow. Not at all, Mr. Keene. Assuming that he is dead, his will cannot be probated, nor can his estate be distributed for at least five years. You see... There must be proof of death through the finding of the body. Or else, under the laws of this state, five years must pass until he can be presumed to be legally dead. Well, I didn't know that. Everybody knows that. Be that as it may, Cousin Herbert. Uncle Adam will turn up all right. What makes you so sure, Miss Harriet? A Harriet's? bad penny always turns up. Somebody knocking? It's I, Mr. Keene, Herbert Mead. Oh, come in. Mr. Keene. One moment, I'll switch on the bed lamp. I'm sorry to waken you. It was my first chance to break away from the others. What's the trouble? I don't know whether Dorothy has been completely frightened, Mr. Keene. In what regard? When Uncle Adam walked off that night, he wasn't alone. Oh, really? 
I was looking out of the library window. Down the path, Uncle Adam was joined by... Well, family loyalty is a good thing, but... Come, come, Mr. Mead. The best way is to have it all come out now. Surely we could enter a plea of insanity for him. For Roscoe, you mean? You've seen one of his wages, I believe. Yes. Uncle Adam always was ridiculing poor Roscoe's military campaigns. But the body... Mr. Keene, I know the grounds have already been searched once. But I noticed this morning that the way Nero was mooning around in the back of the house. It's only a stab in the dark, but I... Yes, go on. Tomorrow, by daylight, we'll go there together. All right. First thing in the morning. Good morning, Mr. King. Good morning, Mike. Huh. Something on your mind, boss? Well, Mike, yesterday at lunch I set a trap. And? What, tell me about it. There was no pebble in my shoe yesterday. I was examining a trouser cuff. I, I don't follow you. Come along, Mike. We have an appointment this morning with Herbert Mead. Maybe he's gone downstairs by now, Mr. King, too. Maybe. But let's try the door. Okay. Boss, Scott. Oh, look at him there in the bed. Blood all over his face. Quick, let's get to him. Mr. Mead. Herbert. Herbert. Oh, my a nasty gash on his forehead, sir. Herbert, can you hear me? Boss, he must be dead. No. He seems to be just barely breathing. Mike, run downstairs. Have somebody phone for a doctor. Okay, boss. Well, what are you doing there, sir? Having a look in the closet, Mike. What for? The killer? No, just his trousers. Well, we certainly had a fright, Mr. King. What did the doctor say, Miss Dorothy? Nasty cut for Cousin Herbert, but no fracture, fortunately. Does Herbert have any idea who attacked him? Just going back to discuss that with him now. You coming with me, Mr. King? As a matter of fact, I'll join you later, if you don't mind. I want to have a look in your uncle's tool shed, if I may. Of course, anything, only we must find out once and for all who's responsible for all these horrors in this house. Oh, poor Herbert. Don't you think you should stay in bed? Oh, don't worry, Dorothy. I'll be all right. And you have no idea who it was? I was deep asleep. Next thing, something came down on my head. I remember the pain and nothing. Why, you could have been killed. I wasn't hit with much force, the doctor said. Dorothea, that makes me start wondering. Perhaps... Oh, no, no. But Harriet is such a strange one, always sulking, always taking Roscoe's part. Oh, Herbert. May I come in? Why, of course, Mr. King. I see you're sitting up, Mr. Mead. And, and you, Mr. King. I'm afraid so, my dears. Afraid? What I mean is, uh, you know that old black walnut tree out there in back? You can just about see the top of it from that window? Yes. Well, what about it? Well, just before your uncle's disappearance, some work was being done on the 12 oaks out in front, wasn't it? They had rotted. This way, so. And that's understandable. But I find also that another tree was treated the same way. Bored out, refilled with cement. That is very strange. Why, Mr. Keaton? Black walnut doesn't usually decay like that. It doesn't ordinarily require that sort of surgery. A few minutes ago, I had that cement filling broken open. Oh, dear God, you mean... Your uncle, Adam Mead, has been lying inside that tree for two weeks. Dead. Oh. Entombed in the black walnut by the person who killed him. Who was that person? The possibilities are numerous. Somebody who was mentally unbalanced, possibly. A thief, possibly. You mean... Or else a rather greedy and ruthless man who knew nothing about the laws of inheritance. Who? Who? You, Herbert Mead. What, what did you say, Mr. Oh, King? Now we've got a third lunatic in the house. But, Keen, don't you realize that I was nearly killed here myself? Nearly killed, yes. 
You staged that attack yourself and hit yourself just hard enough to bring blood. No worse. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, when you found me, I was completely unconscious. Correct. The answer is in this night table. See? A box of sleeping powder, half gone. First you gashed yourself, then you took a big dose of the sleeping powders, and then waited for results. Well, you're out of your mind. You see, while you lay there unconscious, I didn't waste too much time in pity. I looked in your closet, examined the cuffs of every pair of trousers you wear. I, I don't understand. In two of them, I found granules of wood, a black walnut scraping. In a third, bits of cement. Oh, now, just a moment. Night after night, while the men working on the oaks left their equipment around, you went out and worked on the black walnut, making a tomb. Then, when it was ready, you went out in the dark after your uncle and strangled him. Mug! The same way you attacked my assistant later. You see, you did not understand the laws of legacy, Serpent Me. But when I mentioned it at the table yesterday, you realized you'd made a mistake. You realized the body had to be found. And you gave me hints to guide me. You said Nero had been mooning around in back. Then, my dear fellow, you really gave yourself away. Stand back, King, both of you. Got a pistol. Careful, Into Mead. the closet, you two. You won't get far, Mead. I've already been in touch with the police. Stop that pistol, Mead. I've got you covered. Thank you, sir. That was well done. I heard every word of it. I arrest you, Herbert Mead, for the murder of your uncle, Adam Mead. <laughs> On time, Mike. You'll soon be getting into Pennsylvania Station. I'm sure when I tell me, old lady, just how close she came to losing her precious Michael Clancy. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> but, boss, I wonder what on earth you'd ever do if you didn't happen to know about things like black walnut trees and the laws of inheritance. What would I do, Mike? I wouldn't be a detective. <laughs> And so ends the case of the Moonless Night. Listen next week at the same time as Mr. Keene brings us the bizarre and baffling case of the missing witness. <laughs> to help bring out the gleaming natural brightness of your teeth, remove common surface stains by brushing them with a the new colonel, a high-polishing toothpaste. Colonos acts like a jeweler's polish in removing tarnish from silver. It quickly removes surface stains and helps make your teeth and smile look their dazzling, romantic best. Try the new Colonos toothpaste tonight. You have just been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, over this network. Don't miss Mr. Key next Thursday night when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the missing witness. And now, one closing thought. Many of you listening in have signed the Home Front Pledge, a pledge made by 15 million Americans in the past year to pay no more than top legal prices and accept no ration goods without ration points. If all of us will do these two simple things, we will soon wipe out the black market, cut down the cost of living, and ensure a fair share of food for the wives and families of our fighting men and millions of others living on fixed income. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste and Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> there is now a wonderfully inexpensive, easy way to wax wood floors and linoleum to a high, sparkling finish in only six to nine minutes. Use Aero Wax, a self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy, 
dries without rubbing to a marvelous high luster, adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbings, yet costs only 25 cents a pint. Get Aerowax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. This is a Columbia Broadcasting System. Thousands of women are finding that economical, no-rubbing Aerowax makes dingy old floors shine and sparkle look like new. Just apply, and in six to nine minutes, it dries to a hard, lustrous wax finish that saves countless scrubbings and polishing. Yet, Aerowax costs only 25 cents a pint at grocery, hardware, drug, and chain stores. Get Aerowax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8, Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, if your teeth are not every bit as bright and lustrous as they should be, resolve right now to bring out the natural sparkle of your smile with colonos. A high-polishing toothpaste. You see, the new Colonos acts on your teeth as a jeweler's polish does on tarnished silver. Safely, gently removing dingy surface stains. Thereby uncovering the full natural sparkle of your smile. Ask your druggist for Colonos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos Toothpaste. <laughs> Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. Tonight he brings us the case of the missing witness, one of the strangest of his career. A case in which murder, three beautiful women, and a fashion show are all strangely mingled. But listen now. As our story opens, a man is seated in a chair. Across his head slants a bar of sunlight, and on his face is a completely incredulous smile. He rises slowly to say, don't be a fool, my dear. Put it down before you hurt yourself. Can't you hear me? Stop this ridiculous play acting. Put it down, I say. <laughs> you really did it. I didn't think you had it in you. Does you? <laughs> Now our scene shifts to the quiet office of Mr. Keene, as his spinster secretary, Miss Ellis, enters to ask a favor. Mr. Keene, I wonder if I might get off early this afternoon. You want to do some shopping, Miss Ellis? Oh, no, no. I'm going to a fashion show. Why, Miss Ellis, I didn't know you were interested in fashion shows. But are you insinuating that I dress like a bag of potatoes? No. Oh, oh, no. no. Uh, As a matter of fact, Mr. Keene, it's something very, very special. You see, when I was living in Queens about 15 years ago, there used to be a little widow next door. Pretty little creature. Oh, such a struggle to make a living for herself and her daughter. I'd give her a bit of sewing every now and then to help, and... <laughs> well, you won't believe me when I tell you her name. Try me. Mary Blaine. Today, she's the most brilliant in America. Good heavens, that is... The dress, the dinner suit, the short evening gown. She's enormously famous and wealthy now. Yes, I read a piece about Mrs. Blaine in one of the magazines. It called her the epitome of the successful career woman. Well, she's giving her mid-season fashion show today, and she asked me to come for all lang syne. Oh, brilliant woman. Ah, uh, Mary's a... Hey, look here, Mr. Keene. Don't you come along and meet her. <laughs> Me? Dozens of men there, and all in love with Beauty Blaine. Oh, oh do come. Now you've not... Well, uh, uh, All right, Miss Ellis. 
The general talking to her, right? She is beautiful, all right. Success. How do you mean? There's an expression in her face of strain, anxiety. Maybe. Oh, she's noticed me. Here she comes. Isn't she stunning in that little gray number? Mm. Miss Ellis, I'm so glad you could come. Well, thank you, Mary, dear. And I took the liberty of bringing my boss, Mr. Keene. How do you do, Mr. Keene? Delighted to know you. I've been hearing about you for years from Miss Ellis. How wise you are. And how kind. Now, now, don't give away any secrets. <laughs> but it's very sweet of you to break away from all those generals and things to say hello to just me, Mary. You were my friend when I was nobody. Well, you've always deserved the best friends in the world, Mary. And, uh, oh, look, somebody's waiting to you. Oh, oh, my manager, it's time for the show to begin. I'll have to get up to the microphone there to announce the new models as they come by. I'm so glad to have met you, Mr. King. The pleasure was mine. Yes, she is lovely and famous, but not quite happy. Oh, you with your X-ray eyes. Well, here starts the fashion parade, Mr. Keene. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, my first offering, a long dinner dress with panel of pleated white chiffon tied with a grosgrain ribbon at the back. Mm. Isn't that stunning? Yes, even an old bachelor can see that. Uh, especially an old bachelor. <laughs> so it's funny, I don't see Eric Plummer here, Miss Keene. Eric Plummer? You mean the portrait painter? Yes, and gay dog number one of New York. Oh, they're good friends, Miss Ellis? He's been infatuated with Mary for some time. You mean he and Mrs. Blaine are going to marry? Well, Mary's a strange one, Mr. Keene. Never quite sure whether men love her for herself or her importance. But it seems that Eric Plummer has finally won her heart. And now a black velour suit with lean, plumb-lined skirt. A double-breasted jacket with high scroll lapel and a scroll hip pocket. Oh, and look, Mr. Keene, over there by the door. Yes, Miss Ellis? That charming little blonde, that's Mary's daughter, Bunny. Quite a young lady. Uh, it's hard to believe that Mary would have a daughter 18 years old. Yes, yeah, she's still so young herself. Hmm. Mary won't be too pleased about her coming here. Why? Well, Mary just likes to keep Bunny away from business and career and men of the world. Oh. Mary's learned to value everything old-fashioned. A little white house with chintz curtains. In other words, one of America's greatest career women thinks that a woman's place is really in the home. And a simple home. Miss Ellis. Miss Ellis. And no bunny here. Miss Ellis, how long has the show been going on? About 15 minutes. I must talk to Mother. I must. But dear, she's up there at the microphone. You can see. Something horrible has happened. I must talk to her. But bunny, what do you mean? <laughs> and now with my last offering before the intermission. Another short dinner dress. <laughs> Mother, mother. She's seen you, Bunny. She's coming this way. Oh, now, dear, try to quiet yourself. And here, let me introduce you to Mr. King. How do you do, Bunny? Mr. King, you're the famous detective. I am an investigator. Well, maybe you can do something about this horrible thing. What horrible thing, Bunny? Hello, Bunny, dear. Mother. Darling, I, I thought you were going skating with your young soldier friend. No, I didn't. Oh, Mother. Mother. Oh, come, Bunny. What's happened? I, I went to Eric Plummer's studio instead half an hour ago. To Eric's studio? Why? He asked me to tea. He wanted to talk about, about doing my portrait. He might have asked me about that. Oh, it was all to be a surprise, Mother. Eric said it would make me the toast of cafe society. I'd become glamour girl number one of 1944. Oh, my dear. You should have gone skating. Bob Martin is such a fine boy, and, and his fellow will be up soon. Mother, I still haven't told you what happened. If you'd rather we left you alone. Oh, no, no, Mr. King, please stay. I beg you to. Well, what has happened, Benny? When I got to the studio and rang the doorbell... A policeman came out. A policeman? He asked me all sorts of questions because... Because, you see, Eric's been shot. Shot? Oh, yes. Through the head. He's dead, Mother. He's dead. Oh, how utterly horrible. The police said there weren't any clues at all. Oh, imagine anybody killing a wonderful man like Eric Plummer. It's ghastly. Ghastly. I want to find the person who killed Eric. I want to make them pay. And that's why I thought maybe Mr. Keene... Yes, Mr. Keene. In a situation like this, 
You'd know exactly what to do. But if the police are already on the case... Oh, well, one moment, please. Bunny, go over to Mr. LaRue and ask him to announce the rest of the show. All right, Mother. And you, Mr. Keene, would you please step into my office with me? Oh, forgive me, Miss Ellis. Oh, it's quite all right, Mary. Here. Here, Mr. Keene. Thank you. Well, my dear? Mr. Keene, Bunny's news did not altogether surprise me. Really? In fact, I know very well who killed Eric Plummer. You do? But first, Mr. Keene, I've heard you're the cleverest private investigator in this country. Thank you. Do something for me, please. Go to Eric's studio. Examine all the evidence. And when you come back... Yes? I'll tell you who killed Eric Plummer. <laughs> Good afternoon, Captain Thomas. Oh, well, if it isn't Mr. Keene, your assistant with you, the one and only Mike. Glad to see you both. Good day to yourself, Captain. You're handling the police investigation, Captain? That's right, Mr. Keene. Come in. Thank you. Well, what brings you here, if I may ask? I was with Eric Plummer's fiancée, Mrs. Mary Blaine, when she got word of the shooting. She's very upset, naturally. She asked me to look into it. Do you mind? Not at all, Mr. Keene. It's murder, all right. Has the medical examiner been here yet? We're waiting for him now. If I might look at the body. Certainly. This way, sir. In this room here. Yep. There he is. Just the way we found him. Hmm. He had been sitting by his easel in the center of the room. But there's nothing on the easel, boss. Just an empty frame. Quite right, Mike. We figure there was once a painting there, Mr. Keene. And the person who shot him was being painted. Then ripped it off the frame to avoid identification. Yes. Very possible indeed, Captain. Now then, if I may look at the wound. Right there in the head. <sighs> no powder marks. No. The path of the bullet, it entered just above the right ear at uh, the distance of the... What would you say, Captain? Doesn't it seem to you that bullet was fired from 15 feet or more? Now, I leave that kind of guessing to the medical examiner. Hmm... Oh, uh, may I ask why you're staring at the walls now, Mr. King? I was wondering about the proportions of this room. I measured it already. Twenty by twenty. Oh, thank you. No sign anywhere of the gun that killed him? None. May I ask how you learned about the shooting? Uh, through a neighbor. The shot resounded pretty loud in the air shaft back of that window there. And the neighbor who heard it? A gal who has the studio in the back. Portuguese gal. Rosa Avalar. She was taking a bath at the time she heard the shot. Quick as she could, she came and knocked on the door here. No answer, so she sent for us. Well, thank you, Captain. I won't trouble you any further. Rosa Avila. This is her daughter, sir. All right, Mike. Wait for me on the landing below. I'd rather go in alone. Okay, Mr. Miss Avila? Yes? I'm taking a hand in the investigation of the murder next door. Well, I have already talked with the police. Just one or two questions more. Why not? I want to help as much as I can. This Mr. Plummer was a very kind gentleman. In what way? Oh, he is a painter and I am a painter. But I am a little one, a poor one. He made me many loans of materials. Very generous. As one artist to another, eh? Oh, yes, of course. Well, what I'd like to know is, did you see who entered his studio in the hours before he was shot? No. I am busy painting a flower piece. That one there? Yes. It's lovely. Uh, you like it? Very much. I presume you're working from that vase of roses on the windowsill. Yes, that's right. Hmm. Well, now, after the shooting, did you hear anybody running from the studio? Well, I am not sure. You see, I am taking a bath. With the window closed. I hear a loud noise like a shot, but nothing else. Thank you. Sorry to have troubled you. <laughs> no trouble at all. Well, Mr. Keene? Mike, I'd like you to check something for me right away. Why, sure, sir. While I go back to see Mrs. Blaine, I want you to dig up the landlord of this house and just as routine, check on these points. <laughs> And 
just a few moments, the scene follows between Mr. Keene and Mary Blaine. Meanwhile, remember, first impressions are usually lasting impressions. People judge you by the way they see you. They decide almost at once whether they want to know you better or not. And one of the greatest factors that influence everyone you meet is your teeth. If your teeth are dull and discolored by circus stains, chances are nine times out of ten that others find you unattractive. That's why I want to tell you about the new Colonos toothpaste. It's a high-polishing toothpaste. Thousands more people every day are discovering it does wonders in helping to remove from the teeth those dingy-looking surface stains so that the natural sparkle and brilliance is revealed. What's more, Colonos is delightfully pleasant to use because it leaves your mouth feeling tingling clean and refreshed. For its action is like a jeweler's polish removing tarnish from a piece of silver. So if you want a smile that makes a good impression, that adds to your charm and personality, try the new Colonos toothpaste, a high-polishing toothpaste. Get Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos toothpaste at any drugstore tonight. And now Mr. Keene faces Mary Blaine, Eric Plummer's beautiful and famous fiancée. Here, yeah, Mr. Keene. Sit down. Thank you, Mrs. Blaine. You went there. You examined the evidence. Yes. I fulfilled my part of the bargain. And now I'll have to fulfill mine. Well, my dear, you said you knew who killed Eric Plummer. I did, Mr. Keene. I killed him. You? I fancied you'd say that. Oh, not because I'm shielding anybody else. Please don't get the conventional idea that my daughter, that Bunny, perhaps... No, no. But... If you did it, why did you send me back to look at the evidence? Because, because I hoped and prayed that perhaps I didn't do it. Oh, I, I know all this sounds mad. Tell me the whole story. The whole story, Mr. King? I've given my best years to fight my way to the top. Now it's just one long nightmare of anxiety to stay there. Men flock around me. Why? For my money... My fame, or for myself, I can never be sure. When I met Eric Plummer, I, I knew he led a rather wild life, but he was a great artist in his own right. And when he told me he loved me, it sounded real for once. Well, I hoped it was real. Yes, my dear. Go on. Lately, he's been painting my portrait. Once I took Bunny to watch, that was a mistake. Eric went to work on Bunny with all his charm. A man old enough to be her father. I want to keep Bunny wholesome and natural, Mr. Keene. I asked Eric again and again to stop turning her head. Today, this morning, I went to sit for him again. And to have it out with him once and for all. I was sitting on the dais, and he was painting. He looked up and laughed. He said... <laughs> well, my dear, you wouldn't be jealous of Bunny now, would you? Don't be silly, Eric. I just want you to leave Bunny alone. <laughs> Such a hackneyed situation, isn't it? The poor man starts by falling in love with the mother, and then suddenly he sees that after all, it's the daughter he loves. Eric, you don't love anybody. It's all a game with you. Ah, me. The eternal triangle. He'd taken that tone with me before, Mr. Keene laughed at me. This time I was desperate. I wasn't going to let him ruin Bunny's life. I brought along a revolver. I took it from my bag. Eric looked up and said, Mary, you're much too sophisticated for that kind of nonsense. You must promise me never to see Bunny again. <laughs> Eric, I'm serious about this. Believe Don't me. Don't be a fool, my dear. Put it down before you hurt yourself. Can't you hear me? Stop this ridiculous play acting. Put it down, I say. <laughs> you really did it. I didn't think you had it in you. <laughs> and there he lay dead before you, Mrs. Lane. Mr. Kane, will you believe me? I was... I was horrified. I never really meant to pull that trigger. I only wanted to frighten him. And suddenly... He was... Dead. Oh, I suppose I should give myself up to the police. One moment. 
Before you do anything like that, what has become of the gun? Well, after I ran from the house, my first thought was to get rid of it. I threw it away. Where? There was a can of cinders standing in front of one of the houses. I pushed the gun inside and covered it over. That, my dear, was a great mistake. You went and buried your own best witness. Witness? Yes. To the fact that you never shot Eric Plummer. But I didn't shoot him. No. It was a physical impossibility. Why? Why do you say that? Better answer. Hello? Uh, begging your pardon. May I speak to Mr. King? One moment, please. Mr. King. Thank you. Hello? Boss, Mr. King. Oh, hello, Mike. What did you find out? Boss, you hit it on the nose. Good, Mike. I'm glad. Now, something else for you to do. Yes, sir. Check with the sanitation department at once. Ask what they've done with the cinders they removed this morning from the 3000 block in East 58th Street. Cinders? What I'm really after is a gun. The caliber... 38. 38. Mike, we must have it. Talk of a needle in a haystack. I know you won't fail me, Mike. Okay, sir. So you think I did not kill Eric? Strange, isn't it? I have to get evidence to convince you of your own innocence. But if I didn't, who did, Mr. King? That, my dear, is another story. And a rather tragic one. Forgive me if I run along now. Oh. So you are here again. The old gentleman. Yes, I'm afraid I must trouble you again. With more questions? This is a matter of life or death. For whom? A woman, her daughter, other person. Well, what do you want now? Permission to inspect your studio. I want to study the layout. Sorry, I cannot talk to anyone. Mr. Avila! She slammed the door in my face. Come in. Good morning, boss. It's me. Not fit to stand in anybody's office. Why, Mike, you're all covered with ashes. Like a specter risen from the grave. I've been digging through a mountain of ashes all night. Where? Over on the East Drive. They were there taking it for landfill. Did you find it, Mike? Here you are, boss. Good work. Have a look inside. Mike, I'm going back to Mary Blaine's place at once. I beg your pardon, sir. Are you going in there by any chance to see Mrs. Blaine? Yes, Corporal. You are a Corporal, aren't you? Yes, sir. Bob Martin's my name. My name is Keene. I believe you're a friend of Bunny's. Oh, I'm crazy about her. I came up on this furlough just to see Bunny. She locks herself away from me. Won't come to the phone. Not sophisticated enough for her, I guess. I rather fancy she may soon have her fill of sophistication. Well... I just thought if you saw Bunny around inside there... I'll be glad to tell her you're here. And too bashful to break in. Thank you. Oh, Mr. King. I've been waiting so anxiously ever since you phoned that you were coming. Can we speak somewhere privately? Of course. This door. Mr. King. Hello, Bunny. You have good news for us. Bunny knows everything I, I told her. I don't see how I ever could have thought Eric was glamorous. Well, we found a gun, Mrs. Blaine. Look at it. It's mine. The one I tried to get rid of. Not one of the cartridges has been fired. You are sure? My dear, you couldn't possibly have killed him. And for many reasons. What do you mean? You say Eric Plummer was facing you when you aimed the revolver? Yes, Mr. Keene. But the bullet actually entered from the side of his head. The side? In fact, judging from the lack of powder marks, from the distance at which the fatal bullet was obviously fired... Nobody inside that room could have killed him. Why, Mr. King? The room is 20 by 20. With Plummer sitting in the center, it is easel. A person aiming the pistol with arm outstretched would nowhere have been more than 10 feet from him. But the bullet traveled at least 15 feet. 15? Then where did it come from? Outside the apartment. From a studio just across the narrow air shaft and through the open window of Plummer's studio. And the person who killed him? A young lady, I'm afraid... Also a painter. We learned from the landlord that it was Plummer who engaged the little back studio for her a year ago. Eric did? Yes. 
And who's supposed to be so madly in love with Mother? For the past three months, her rent hasn't been paid at all. Plummer finally lost interest. The young lady, Miss Avalar, seems quite hot-tempered. Charm. Glamour. And in the end, murder. Come in. Oh, Mr. Keith. Captain Thomas. Your office said I'd find you here. I have a message for you. For me? It was addressed to the old gentleman. We figured out that means you. From, from Rosa Avalar. Yeah. Read it. Old gentleman. You are very wise. You guessed the truth. Now I will save everybody's time by sentencing myself. Rosa Avalar. Oh, she... She committed suicide? Half hour ago, ma'am. I'm sorry about this. Truly sorry. Well, that closes the case. I'll have to get along now and write the police report. Goodbye, Captain Thomas. Mr. King, how can I ever thank you? You were innocent, Mrs. Blaine. I was happy to be able to help you. Eric. Everything about him was so mean, so heartless. That reminds me, Bunny. I believe there's a boy, a very bashful one, who's hanging around outside. Oh, not poor Bob. Yes, poor Bob. A boy your own age. With ten times the real glamour of a man like Eric Plummer. Poor dear, he must be furious with me. No, just dying to see you. My dear, whenever you're tempted to see glamour in a man like Eric Plummer, remember that all that glisters is not gold. Often you have heard that told. Gilded tombs do worms enfold. How terribly true. I've realized it for a long time. And now, so do I. All right, Bunny. Run along with you and make that poor, bashful soldier happy. And so Mr. Keene concludes the case of the missing witness. Listen next week at the same time as he brings us the baffling and colorful case of the girl who sang too well. Every girl and woman knows that in order to be popular today, one of the most important things she needs is an attractive smile. A smile that reveals clean and sparkling teeth. And to the man in business, teeth that make a good impression are just as important, too. If you're not certain that your own teeth are as attractive as they should be, here's something you will want to know. The new Colonos high-polishing toothpaste does wonders in helping to remove those dingy surface stains. Helps reveal the natural brilliance of your teeth that add so much to the charm and personality of your smile. I'll tell you why it does this. It's action on teeth. Is like that of a jeweler's polish on tarnished silver. So start using Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste yourself, right away. You can get Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonos at any drugstore tonight. You've just been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time. Every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8, Eastern Wartime over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the girl who sang too well. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste and Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. <laughs> Ladies, there's a wonderful new way to make floors sparkle like new in six to nine minutes flat. Use Aero Wax, the self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy, dries without rubbing. Its marvelous high luster adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbing. Yet it costs only 25 cents a full pint. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sparkling new-looking floors in just six to nine minutes. Ladies, that's good news. Use economical, no-rubbing Aero Wax. 
just apply and it dries to a marvelous high wax luster that makes rooms lovelier, saves frequent scrubbings or polishing. Yet a full pint of Aerowax costs only 25 cents at hardware, drug, grocery, and 10 cent stores. Aerowax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, will make you proud of your floors. <laughs> Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Kalanos Toothpaste present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, for bright, sparkling teeth, a million-dollar smile, try the new Colonel's toothpaste. It's a high-polishing toothpaste that acts like a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from silver. Safely, speedily, it whisks away dingy surface stains that cloud your smile and reveals the full natural brilliance of your teeth. Get the new high-polishing Kalanos at any drugstore tonight. Ask for Kalanos Toothpaste. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. And now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. Tonight our story opens in one of the great movie palaces of Broadway, the Palladium, where for three weeks the stage presentation has been a sensational success. Skip Gordon's review, starring Lola Bennett. As the spotlight cuts across the vast theater to the stage, it falls on a beautiful golden-haired girl, Lola Bennett, singing in the wistful style that has made her a hit overnight. number from our orchestra, a special arrangement of that outstanding hit, Pistol Packin' Mama. <laughs> Take it away, Maestro, while yours truly cools off in the wing. Oh, Skip. Yeah, Joe? I've been stage manager here ten years. I've never seen a gal win over a crowd like Lola. <laughs> Swell kid. they doing out there? <laughs> Just a pistol sound effect in the number. Don't you like it? I'll take a blockbuster. <laughs> hey, where is Lola? I thought she'd be here in the wings. She's ducked back to her dressing room, Skip, to fix her makeup. <laughs> hey, it's time for Lola to go on again. Well, I'll run down and knock on her door, huh? Okay, I'll signal the band to do another chorus. Meanwhile... On stage, Laura. On stage. Well, Joe, what's this? No answer. Well, look inside. She's not there. But it can't be. I'll ask the doorman if she went out. Well, hurry, Joe. Will you hurry? Hey, Charlie. Yeah, Joe. Have you seen Lola? No, nope, not this way. Lola. 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 Hey, Lola, baby, where are you? Lola. Where are you? say, Mr. Gordon, that she hasn't been seen since she disappeared last night? No, Mr. King. In all my years in show business, I've never known anything like it to happen. You tried her home, Mr. Gordon? Uh, call me, Skip, won't you? 
Well, sure, we tried her home and no soap. I, I don't get it, Mr. Keene. Especially since she knew we were going to give her a farewell party, too, after the show. A farewell party? That was her last performance with my review. She goes into the Sky Top Club this weekend at Star Attraction. I made her take the offer. How do you mean? Well, I had her under contract ever since I found her singing in Cleveland six months ago. The minute she got the right song, she went over like wildfire. Now the Sky Top wants her. Well, when they sent her the contract, she showed it to me and said... No, Skip. I'm not signing that contract. Oh, don't be crazy, kid. It doubles your pay. Gives you top billing. Skip, you've been just wonderful to me. You taught me how to dress, to carry myself, to really think. I'm not walking out on you. Look, Lola. Here's another contract. Yours and mine. Well? You've torn it up. I'm no jail warden, baby. You're heading straight for the top, and I'm not holding you back. Not on your life. That was very generous of you. Generous, Mr. Keene? I love Lola. Even though I've never told her. Never told her? <laughs> she wouldn't even have looked at me. Oh, but find Lola, Mr. Keene. That's all I'm asking. Find Lola. Well, the place to start is obviously the Palladium, where she was last seen. That's a famous old house, as I remember. Ah, uh, sure. In the old vaudeville days, we used to talk about making the Palladium. <laughs> when you played there, it meant you were good. Still does. And Lola made it with this engagement. Three smash weeks. All right, Skip. Let's go. Hello, Charlie. Why, hello, Mr. Gordon. Oh, by the way, Mr. Keene, this is the stage doorman, Charlie Barnes. How do you do? Glad to know you, sir. You think you'll find her? I'll do my best. A swell little lady. Incidentally, Charlie, uh... You were on duty last night? Yes, sir, Mr. King. You're sure she didn't leave the theater? Well, she couldn't have. Not without creating a riot. Why? The place was surrounded with autograph hounds. Oh. Well, now, Skip, uh, if we could have a look in her dressing room. Oh, sure, right this way. I told the house manager to leave it exactly the same as it was last night. Good idea. Uh, thank you, Charlie. I'm glad to oblige you, Mr. King. Well, Skip, I gather your review is staying on at this theater. Yeah, another week. With a replacement for Lola. Uh, here we are now. After you. Uh, thank you. Hmm. The usual dressing room. Chair, dressing table, wardrobe trunk. Yeah, that's right. And telegrams of congratulations. Pasted up on the mirror. Yeah. Sing, Canary, sing. I love you, I love you, I love you. Repeated two dozen times. Now, the telegrams are mostly from Larry Reeves. Reeves? Yeah. Oh, he's a well-known Broadway playboy, isn't he? Yeah, with more money than is good for him, too, and more wives. Married four times, divorced four times. I gather he wanted Lola for the fifth? Yeah, I've been making quite a pitch. Even a smart kid like Lola got to believing him. They were almost engaged. Almost? Yeah, he sent Lola a ring last week. Diamond like a headlight. <laughs> Did it burn him when Lola sent it back? Hmm. I suppose this is her costume trunk. That's right. Hey... You don't think... Is there a key around? A uh, key? Uh, there's one on the dressing table. Oh, we'll try it. Uh, these are her costumes, Kit. Yeah, some of them. I remember others. Oh? Where, the, where are they? Well, I, I wouldn't know. Oh, Skip. Hey, Skip. Now, that's Tommy Toller, my band leader. Hey, Skip. We start the first show in ten minutes. Yeah, I know. This is Mr. King. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Oh, yeah. You said you were going to ask him to. Hey, that reminds me. Of what, Tommy? Well, I wanted to mention it before, but I didn't want to talk out of turn. Well, come on, give, Tommy, will you? You know my goofy saxophonist, Harry Forbes. Uh, yeah. Harry's had a crush on Lola for months, hanging around and pestering her day and night. Well, right after you left the stage last night, Skip, and we started pistol packing Mama, remember? Yeah. Harry signaled me. He whispered he's got to leave the stage. Oh, he looked so crazy. I said, all right. So he slips out behind the drapes. Very interesting. And then I don't see him for 15 minutes. And the funny part about it... What was so funny about it? Oh, hello, Harry. What was so funny? All right. I'll say it right to your face, Harry. You walked off the stage carrying a gun. We all had guns. Phony guns for the pistol packing number. Now, just a minute. Am I to understand you used guns, pistols, as stage props for the performance of the number of pistol packing mama? Yes, Mr. Keene. But the rest of us had our guns on stage. 
He could have had his loaded. Are you trying to say If that... anybody wanted to shoot Lola, that was the time to do it. During all that noise. You skunk. No, your band leader is right, Paul. It was his duty to tell us. Why did you go off the stage? Oh. Because I felt sick. I wanted to take a pill. I told him that. Okay, okay. Okay, nothing. One of these days, you'll have to get yourself a new sack. Now, uh, hey, Harry, wait a minute. No, now, wait. Never mind, Skip. And thank you, Mr. Tolan, for this information. Oh, I figured I had to tell you, Mr. Keene. That guy's wacky. Well, the curtain's in five minutes. Yeah, I'll be there. Well, Mr. Keene, how does it add up to you? It doesn't, yet. Better get along for your performance, Skip. The performance, yeah. yeah. You'll be sticking around. Right here in the dressing room. Okay. Those telegrams. I love you. I love you. I love you. Miss Keene. Yes? I was waiting till the others went away. Who are you? I'm just a dresser around here. Take care of the performer's clothes. Well? Look, uh, this note. She gave it to me last night. She said that if he came again, I was to give it to him. In excitement last night, I forgot. You better have it. Thank you. Marie. Marie. Oh, quick, put it in your pocket. That's Larry Reed, Mr. King. You know, the playboy. Hey, Marie, why didn't you answer when I called? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Reed. I didn't hear you. Any word yet about Lola? No, Mr. Reed, nothing. Who's this? Anybody? Can't be. I don't know. Thank you. Gold digger, she's going to run out on me. She's not a gold digger. I, shut up. I won't have you talk that way about her. I know a kind playing hard to get. Come and find me. When I do, I'll wring a little neck. Break every bone in her body. Oh, he's just awful, that Mr. Reed. Thinks that for money he can have anything. But Miss Bennett's not his kind. What about this note? She said to give it to him if he came around again to bother her. She was expecting last night? Every night. The doorman was told to keep him out, but there's a way of coming through the front of the house, Mr. King. Oh, I see. Uh, don't open that note here, please, sir. Very well. And if Mr. Skip Gordon asks for me... Tell him I went back to my office. I'll have you know, Miss Ellis, I don't make a practice of reading other people's mail. But good heavens, this is a matter of life or death, perhaps. Oh, come on, what does it say? Well, I'll read it. Dear Larry, I've sent back your ring and that must end it. In my 26 years, I found there is one quality in people that I cannot stand, selfishness. It once cost me a terrible lot, the worst years of my life. If I married you, it would be the same all over again. Well. So it must be goodbye. And please stop threatening. Please? Selfishness. The worst years of my life. What does it mean? Yes, what? As a matter of fact, Miss Ellis, we know almost nothing about Lola Bennett. Skip has known her only six months, and she's never talked of the past. Well, what's the difference? This note points straight to Reed. And other evidence points to Forbes, the musician. No, I've got to know a whole lot more about that girl. But there's only one way to find out. Mm -hmm. How? You know the uh, weekly newspaper footlights? Oh, sure. The Bible of show business. Well, I'd like Mike Clancy to go back through their files and dig up every single mention that was ever made of Lola Bennett. Right, Mr. Keene. Now, get hold of Mike at once. Two people under suspicion of the disappearance of Lola Bennett. And Mr. Keene goes on with his search. Meanwhile, girls, something to blame. Teeth that rob them of charm when they smile. Thousands of men whose livelihood depends on selling themselves to others have the same weakness of appearance to blame. They don't know it or notice it, but the people they contact do. You may or may not be one of those people, but if you have the slightest suspicion that you are, try the new Colonel's toothpaste, the high-polishing toothpaste. You'll find Colonel's helps remove those dingy, unattractive surface stains from your teeth. Brings out all the natural luster and brilliance that adds so much to your smile. Start using the new Colonos tonight. Remember, it's a high-polishing toothpaste. You can get Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonos toothpaste at any drugstore. Now back to Mr. Keene's office and the continuation of the case of the lovely singing star, Lola Bennett. 
Well, here you are, boss. I got three back numbers of footlights that mention her. Oh, thanks, Mike. The first goes back about eight years, when she was just a kid. Oh. A review of a portable act that opened in St. Paul. Billy, the song and dance man. The reviewer says a strictly mediocre act that may do for the sticks, but will never make the palladium. Now, this paragraph here. Accompanying Billy was a pretty little stooge called Lola Bennett, who had nothing to do but be sung at. Now look at the second paper, Mr. King. Eighty-four years later, from Akron, Ohio. Now the act is called Billy and Lola. About this minor league vaudeville act that premiered here last night, nothing much can be said for or against the male heart, silly. But the little blonde who shared the bill, Lola Bennett, showed unusual promise. Two of her numbers, sung with refreshing sincerity, brought down the house. Very interesting. Read that third item, boss. It goes back just two years. Now the act is called Lola Bennett and Billy. <laughs> right. One of the most novel fan singers heard in these parts lately opened last night with a star. Voice full of honey and captivating personality. Should go far with the right training. The act was completed by a novelty instrument number from Billy. Different, but was it good? Well, boss, what do you make of it? The old story of show business. The pupil outgrowing the master. Lola made the palladium, but Billy never did. Billy? Whoever you are. <laughs> That's your private phone, boss. Hello. Hello. Keen Company. Okay, Keen, this is Harry Forbes. You know the saxophone player? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Forbes. I'm going to talk straight out. I want you to lay off me. But, my dear fellow... You don't try to put Lola's disappearance on me. I had nothing to do with it. How did you ever get my private phone number? From Skip Court, and I've warned him, too. Lay off me or else. Or else what? Lay off me, that's all. You hear any of that, Mike? Huh, I did. A maniac. Well, don't you think that he... Well, with the suspicion we got... Oh, never mind. Thing. For another reason. Each of these reviews mentions other acts that appeared on the same bill, Mike. I'd like to find some of those other people. Well, it'll take a lot of digging. But it may give us very valuable information. Try the booking agencies, Mike, and the Actors Hotel at once. Okay. I'm on my way. <laughs> Nice, Mr. Keene, that somebody remembers me after all these years out of show business. I gather, Mrs. Hall, that you once had a comedy act. Ah, wasn't much, but it made folks laugh. On at least one occasion, you played the same theater with a song and dance man called Billy. Billy? Uh, oh, sure. Kind of a sour puss. Why do you say that? Well, I had his heart set on getting to Broadway. Wasn't good enough. What was his surname, Mrs. Hall? Surname? Hmm. Billy, that, that's all he was ever called. Do hmm. you remember his partner? Oh, sure, Lola Bennett. He hired her in St. Paul after his regular partner walked out on him. But what's become of Billy? Billy? Oh, well, I couldn't tell you. Yes, Major Tiny? I'm looking for an old performer called Billy. I remember him, Mr. Keene. My midget act proved all over Canada with him one winter in a eunuch show. Really? My, but what his wife had to put up with. Wife, did you say? Yes, Lola Bennett. Oh, they were married. Two years by then, but they weren't happy. Billy was so jealous. Of the fact that she was becoming more successful than he? Well, that's right, Mr. Keene. He took to drink. Actually beat her up one night. I tried to stop him. Oh? He threatened to walk on me. Oh, a bad character. What was his surname? I never knew. Would you have a photograph of him? No, sir. Thank you. There's still one more chance. Sure, I know, Mr. King. When I was hopping on a Jackson circuit, you see, I used to do a soft shoe number like this. Charming, Mr. Foley. Charming. Yeah, but strictly past the... I'm working up a new routine now, like this. Uh, if I may be so rude, Mr. Foley. Yes? How were they getting on when you knew them? Oh, terrible. You see, the booking agents were thumbs down on him. Why? Well, they said he grabbed the egg. The ball and chain. The guy tried everything. He even worked up a, a novelty, a solo, and 
a song on five different instruments. You know, one after the other. Mm. Still no soap. That Lola stuck by him. Much good it did her. Guy was a maniac. Talking crazy all the time about making a palladium. Hitting Broadway. Well, it got so bad, she finally had to divorce him. I see. By the way, what instruments did he play in that novelty number? Mm, clarinet, fiddle, the saxophone, too? Yeah, saxophone, all right. Yeah, that was his best. Would you by any chance have a photograph of him? A photo? Let's see, yeah. For Winston Buffalo. Yes. We all gave a hospital benefit, and the newspapers took photos. Could you find that photograph? Well, now if I dig around in my press book, I, I might. Let's have a look. Keen and Company. This is Skip Gordon, Mr. Keene. Oh, good morning, Skip. I haven't heard from you in days. Any news, Mr. Keene? There may be tonight. I can reach you at the Palladium still? Yeah, and yeah, we're on for the rest of this week. You know, I got some news for you. Really? Harry Forbes, the saxophone player, walked out of the band last night. We can't locate him. Hmm. That puts the finger on him, I guess. It would certainly look like that. If he's the guy, if he's harmed Lola in any way. Oh, Skip, uh, to be perfectly frank, I'm afraid somebody has harmed her. The king? Who? How? I'll probably have the answer for you tonight. Meanwhile, I must use the phone for a very important call. Okay. See you tonight. Hello? Guy Tough Club. Good. I'd like very much to talk to your manager. Good evening, Charlie. Uh, good evening, Mr. Keene. Any luck yet locating Lola Bennett, Mr. Keene? Yes and no. I don't get it. In a few minutes, a package may arrive here at the Palladium for me. Ask the delivery man to wait before bringing it in. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Meanwhile, where's Mr. Skip Gordon? On stage, introducing a number. By the way, Charlie, the uh, night that Miss Bennett disappeared, was anything moved out of here? No, sir. Uh, but something came in. Uh, some props for our next stage show. I see. Well, uh, Mr. Gordon should be coming off the wings any minute now. A new singer? Yeah, replacing Miss Bennett. But not half as good. Oh, I see Mr. Gordon there now. Hello, Mr. Keene. Hello, Skip. Well, what's the word? Skip, you may have to brace yourself for really bad news. Dead, huh? Dead. Yes, I'm afraid so. The final sacrifice to a very selfish man. Who? Forbes? Reeves? I'll kill whoever it was. Steady, Skip. We'll see that justice is done. Lola was such a swell kid. Time for you to go on stage again, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the show goes on. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's your master's ceremony to get. About to introduce the rip sorting arrangements of the hits of the season, Pistol Pack and Mama. Oh, Mr. Keene. Mr. Keene. Yes, Charlie, I'm coming. Uh, the delivery man came. He's waiting for you. Good, Charlie. I'll walk back with you. If you want any help bringing it in, I... Uh, all that noise... Come, let's find a quiet place. Go into this dressing room. No, no. This... This was Miss Bennett. You don't believe in ghosts, Charlie. Why, what do you mean? Charlie, look at this wardrobe trunk with Miss Bennett's costume. Oh, what about it? She really had two trunks. Two? And when the express company came that night to deliver a certain stop, somebody ordered one of the trunks taken away. Where to? The address was already labeled on, just as on this one. It was sent to the next place where Miss Bennett was engaged to sing, the Sky Top Club. Who, who was responsible for that? It's no mystery to me any longer. A very jealous man, her former husband. I think it produced it. You stay here. I'm staying nowhere. Oh, yes, you are. I'm going out now to have the delivery man bring in that package for me. Listen, Dean. I'm not staying. You're going to watch me open Miss Bennett's second trunk. The one that went to the Skytop Club. 
I'm having it brought in. I'm watching nothing. He'll open the trunk right here in a dressing room. Just between ourselves, there are police stationed at every exit. The killer will never get out of this theater. You, you found her in the trunk? Let me out of here. I... Oh, you're staying right here. I'm locking you in this festival. Oh, hello, Skip. I came off for a breather while the band is playing. What's up? Skip, my boy. It's too bad that Lola didn't meet somebody like you years ago. Unfortunately, the man she did once marry was insanely jealous and possessive. He couldn't bear to see her succeed where he had failed. She tried her best to help him, but... Well, I'd like you to know this much, Skip. She loved you for your generosity. He valued you about anybody in the world. But but who killed her? Who was the man? A man she ran into again the moment she reached this chair three weeks ago. Darn it all. Those pistol shots. Didn't you notice something peculiar then, Skip? Hey, what do you mean? One shot was nearer than any of the others. Creepers. Creepers, you mean? It came from this dressing room. Quick, get that door open. The doorman. He shot himself. Dead as a doornail. Mr. Keene, was he the guy? Yes. Her former husband. That's the way he killed Lola that night. He fired the pistol during the band number. Charlie. A doorman. An old and disappointed performer. He made the palladium with the most tragic performance of his life. <laughs> And so ends the case of the girl who sang too well. Listen next week at the same time as Mr. Keene brings us another of his baffling cases, The Man Who Didn't Come Home. Today the girl, or woman who wants to be popular, knows that one of her most important assets is a charming smile, and teeth that sparkle and gleam knows that no matter how smartly she may dress or make up, teeth that are dingy and discolored looking instantly create an unfavorable impression. And the same is true of the man in business, whose very livelihood depends on selling himself. He knows how quickly discolored looking teeth can bring failure. That's why today thousands of smart and successful men and women are changing to the new Colonos high-polishing toothpaste. So for your own sake, try the new Colonos toothpaste yourself. It works like a jeweler's polish on tarnished silver. Dull, revealing the natural brilliance and sparkle of your teeth. Ask for Colonel Tuesday. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. At your drugstore tonight. You've just been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night... 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the man who didn't come home. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Common Oak Toothpaste and Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. <laughs> Famous no-rubbing Aero Wax gives you beautifully waxed shining floors in six to nine minutes flat, and at the cost of only a pick easel. Just apply Aero Wax; it dries to a marvelous luster, cuts out two thirds of your scrubbing. A full fine costs only twenty-five cents. Get Aero Wax, A E R O W A X, tomorrow. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. To save both time and money in waxing floors, use economical no-rubbing Aero Wax. Just apply it, and in six to nine minutes, it dries itself to a hard, lustrous finish that saves countless scrubbing. Makes dingy floors shine like new. Yet Aero Wax costs only 25 cents a pint. Try Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, is your smile everything you'd like it to be? Bright, sparkling, magnetic? If not, try the new Colonel's toothpaste thousands are raving about. It's a high-polishing toothpaste that acts like a jeweler's polish in removing tarnish from silver. Quickly, but also gently, Colonos erases stubborn surface stains from teeth, revealing all their glorious natural brilliance. Get Colonos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos toothpaste at your drugstore tonight. Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, who tonight takes from his files one of his most unusual and most bewildering cases, the case of the girl who flirted. The girl is an art student, gay and beautiful, but just a little too adventurous. It all starts one day in a museum, where Betty March is at work copying a painting, and a charming stranger walks up to say, Not bad. Not bad at all. Well, I beg your pardon. I'd almost say you had signs of talent, young woman. Well, I did not happen to ask your opinion. If anyone in this town knows painting, it's I. I ought to be furious with you. Are you? No. Just terribly amused. I like people to be unconventional. Tell me some more, mister, whoever you are. Yes, that's how it started. Now, several days later, we find Mr. Keene in his office talking to a very distressed man, Robert Colby, assistant curator of the Manhattan Museum. I tell you, Mr. Keene, nothing's ever happened like this. In all the years since the museum was founded, the girl walked off in the midst of copying a painting. There's been no sign of her since. Well, let's start at the beginning, Mr. Colby, shall we? First, what is the girl's full name? Elizabeth March. According to her application for a museum permit, she's now 22. Go on, Mr. Colby, please. Well, lately she's been copying that big painting by Whistler in the American Room. Oh, you mean the portrait of Mrs. Farmington and her daughters? Yes, that's right. Now, the last time I saw Betty was four days ago, Monday. Betty, eh? You're on familiar terms. Oh, she's lovely, Mr. Keene. Charming, spirited. Well, now, under what circumstances did you last see her? I dropped into the American room where she was copying the Whistler painting to ask her to lunch. She looked up from her easel and said, No, Mr. Robert Colby. No can do. Why not? Too busy, Bob. Oh, that man Whistler. Has he insulted you, Betty? Why did he always have to sign his paintings with those complicated little butterflies in one corner? I'm having an awful time trying to copy it. Oh, forget the butterflies, Betty, and come to lunch. I have a question to ask you. Oh, yes. I know. Dum, dum, da dum. Well, will you marry me? No, Mr. Robert Colby, assistant curator of the Manhattan Museum. I will not marry you. Well, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Nothing at all. That's the trouble. I don't understand. You're just too darn correct to be alive. What? <laughs> the man I'm going to marry will have to be somebody exciting, somebody dashing, somebody dangerous. Oh, now stop talking like a Greenwich Village bohemian. <laughs> See, you are a stuffed shirt. Still want to take me to lunch, Mr. Colby? No, I do not, Miss March. Goodbye and good luck. Well, yes, she certainly is a very spirited young woman, isn't she? What happened next? Well, I came back in the afternoon, Mr. Jean, to make up. Her easel was still there in its usual place, but no sign of Betty. So that night I went to her apartment. Still no luck. Again the next day and the day after. This morning, finally, I talked to the attendant in the American room. Did the attendant have anything to report? A great deal. After our little spat, Betty sat down at her easel to work again on the butterfly signature. A few minutes later, a 
tall, dark-haired man came by. He sat by Betty's easel. The next thing the attendant heard Betty say something like this. I like people to be unconventional. Tell me some more, mister, whoever you are. I've seen you here many times before. And I've noticed you. Oh, have you? First time was in the Egyptian room. We bumped into each other in the tomb of the pharaoh. I said, I beg your pardon, miss. And I said, I beg your pardon, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, something more. From where my easel stands, I have a very good view of the Italian room next door. And? You have been observed on three different occasions, standing there in front of the Annunciation of Paralini. Your spies have been busy. You admire the Annunciation very much, don't you? There's another work I admire even more. A 20th century masterpiece. You. <laughs> Wonderful. Who are you, anyhow? Just the man who wandered into a museum and saw a very beautiful girl? <laughs> Seriously. I could tell you better over lunch. Oh, lunch? Please. Well, I, I don't think I ought to give in so easily. Argue with me five minutes more. And did they finally go off together, Mr. Colby? Yes. After Betty finished up a few more details on the painting. Well, what do you think of it, Mr. Keene? Well, frankly, I don't like the sound of it. It wouldn't be the first time a girl was lured into something very unpleasant by a charming stranger. Then please, Mr. Keene, try to find her. I most certainly will, Colby. And as a first step, uh, tell me, is Betty's easel still standing there in the American room? Exactly as it was the last time she used it. Then take me there at once. There you are, Mr. Keene. Judging from this painting, Betty's a very talented girl. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Hmm. Did she usually place her stool in just this spot? Yes, it gave the best light. One moment. What is it, Mr. Keene? Why are you staring so hard at Betty's copy? I wonder if there's a magnifying glass handy. I'll have the attendant get one. Oh, Billings. Uh, yes, Mr. Colby. Look into Mr. Vanderhoff's office, please, and ask him if I could have a magnifying glass for a moment. I'll be right back, sir. Mr. Keene, you've got me up a tree. First, you were talking about the position of the stool. And oh, yes, sir. In fact, I am going to sit down on it right now and make a little investigation. Well, observe one thing. From this position, Betty at all times had a view through that open door into the next room. The Italian room. Oh, there comes the attendant now with that magnifying glass. Here you are, sir. Thanks. <laughs> Let me have it at once. I... Hmm. Oh, what are you looking for, Mr. Keene? I'm... I'm looking for a... By Jove, I found it. What is it? Colby, I was impressed by one thing. You told me how Betty went off with a stranger. But she stopped first to finish a few details. Asked for five more minutes to paint. Yes, yes. Now take this glass. Yes, I have it. Turn it on the butterfly signature in the corner. Concentrate on those very fine strokes in the wings. The wings? Yes, I see it now. Dear Bob, studio tea room. She had a feeling she might be in danger. That message was just in case she didn't come back. Well, of course, but why? What danger? You know that restaurant? Yes, it's a hangout for artists in Greenwich Village. Let's go. Let's go as fast as we can. And I take it, Miss Grudy, that you are the owner of this restaurant? Yeah, that's right. You happen to know Miss Betty March... Of course, she ate here often. I wonder if you remember her coming here last Monday for lunch. Well, uh... Don't uh, mind me, please. This isn't a case of a jealous lover. Oh, well, in that case, yes, she came in with a tall, handsome man and took a table near the cash register here. The reason I remember so well... Uh, yes, Miss Goody? Well, after an hour or so, the place was clearing out, and I heard Betty say... Well, thanks for a very good lunch and some grand conversation. You're not going already. You've got to. Back to the museum. Back to work. Silly idea. Why don't you come along to my place instead? I'll show you some of my own work. Well, it's very kind of you, but I couldn't, really. Would that be too unconventional? Well, I... Just a while ago, you were talking about 
how you loved adventure. Well, I'm going to hold you to that. Please, let go of my arm. Oh, no, you're coming along with me. Even if I have to kidnap you, darling. Let go of me. I'll, I'll scream. <laughs> if you do, I'll put my hand over your mouth and gag you, dear. Help! <laughs> you see, darling, it doesn't help. Better come along quietly now. <laughs> That's a good girl. <laughs> That's a good girl. And then what happened, Miss Goody? Well, there was a car at the curb, and he took her inside and drove off. Great Scott, why didn't you stop him? Oh, well, you know these artists. I thought it was all in fun. Miss Goody... Did you get the license number by any chance? No, there didn't seem to be any reason. Well, thank you anyhow. Well, not at all. I, well, I hope the poor girl hasn't come to any harm. Gone. Vanished completely. I'm afraid so, Colby. What do we do now, Mr. Keene? Now? Now we play another hunch. What do you mean? Tell me something, Colby. What is the most valuable painting your museum owns? Oh, one that I mentioned before, the... Annunciation by Ronaldo Perolini. Well, if you want my advice, remove it from the wall at once. What? Have it examined by the best technical expert on your staff. Do that, and I think I can still find Betty March. Mr. Vanderhoff. How's it coming? Do not disturb me. I will be finished in a moment. He's experts, Mr. Keene. He's been at it all morning. Oh, calm yourself. How can I, when Betty may be in danger of her life? This seems a very roundabout way of finding her, Mr. Keene, if you'll pardon my saying so. But it's the only way I know. Oh, here's Vanderhoff now. He's finished. Oh, so come in, gentlemen. Thank you. Huh? There's the painting. Look at it, gentlemen. A magnificent work of art, as far as the eye can tell. Tell us, Mr. Vanderhoff, what did you find? First, Mr. Colby, in accordance with my usual routine, I subjected the painting to an X-ray examination. I followed this with a spectroscopic analysis. Yes, yes. Uh, finally, I tested minute portions of the pigmentation for chemical content. Well? Uh, gentlemen, <clears throat> I am compelled to report that this masterpiece is a fake. What? Very skillful, but a fake. Impossible. It is a fake, entirely so. The original has been stolen. This copy substituted in its place. That's exactly what I thought and feared. The man who did this is one of the most skillful copyists alive. What type of paint did he use? Or temper, of course. The same as the original. Oil paint did not come into use until several centuries after Perolini. Uh, I must report this to the director at once. Oh, one moment, please, Mr. Van der uh, Yes, Mr. Keene. You may also tell the director that I'll do everything in my power to recover the stolen original. Good, good. And that I strongly advise against any publicity at the moment. I will tell. Mr. Keene, two things aren't really connected. Of course they are. Betty's disappearance and the theft of the painting are one and the same case. But how? How? Well, here's my theory, Colby. The men who stole the Perolini are cautious, methodical people. They must have worked for months to prepare their fake painting. After that, it was only a question of finding the right moment to snatch the original from its frame and substitute the copy. Yes? They decided, of course, to do it on a Monday, when there are few visitors in the museum. Yes, that's the day we charge admission. Usually only students are present. But that still left one obstacle. Betty. You remember I told you that from where she sat, she had a good view of the Italian room at all times? A perfect view of the painting to be stolen? Yes. Well, that's where the charming stranger came in. He was assigned to lure Betty away and keep her away. But why are they still holding her? It's my guess that she'd seen the man admiring the Annunciation just a little too often. She knew something was up. And at lunch with the charming gentleman, she probably gave herself away. Poor kid. So then she had to be held prisoner until the painting was safely disposed of. Uh, uh, sent out of the country, perhaps. But what do we do now? Yes. What do we do now? Mr. Keene, you're supposed to be an investigator, not an echo. My dear fellow, I assure you I'll do everything possible. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me a moment. Uh, let me... Colby, your expert just said that this fake painting was very skillful. But like the original, it was painted in tempera. It fooled me. Correct me if I'm wrong. But there must be very few painters alive today who could do work like that in tempera. A few dozen, that's all, Mr. Keene. All right. I have an assignment for you. Because it takes an art expert. Yes? And if you don't come through, and if 
this doesn't find Betty, I don't know what will. Fire away, Mr. Keene. What's my assignment? Dig up all the catalogs of recent art exhibitions you can find. Go back ten years if necessary. Yes, yes. But get me the name of every outstanding artist in this country who paints in tempera. I will. Somewhere in that list will be the man who did that fake Paralini. We'll check over the entire list. By process of the elimination, we'll find the forger and the gang that abducted Betty March. Right. Get to work at once. <laughs> Intermission and Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, brought to you by Colonel's Toothpaste. Next time you meet the most successful man you know or the most popular girl, take a good look at their teeth. Chances are they'll be sparkling and beautiful, with all the magnetism your own smile should have. Examine your own teeth critically. If they're not every bit as brilliant and gleaming as they should be, if they show signs of being discolored by surface film, just do as thousands do. Try the new Colonel's. A high-polishing toothpaste. Safely, speedily, Colonos helps brush away masking surface film, revealing the natural luster and brightness of your teeth. Your druggist has an ample supply of Colonos on hand, so get a tube tonight and see what wonders it may do in helping you to add to the charm and appeal of your smile. Remember the name Colonos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos. A high-polishing toothpaste. <laughs> Now, as the clock strikes midnight, we find Mr. Keene with his assistant, Mike Clancy. Well, Mr. Keene, I do hate to be breaking into your house at such a late hour, but here are some nice names Mr. Colby's dug up. That's quite all right, Mike, and thank you. And you should have seen the pile of catalogs he's going through. Sure, he was still at his desk when I left the museum working like a beaver. Oh, Colby is still at the museum? That's right, sir. Mike, I suddenly feel another of my hunches coming over me. Well, out with it, boss. Something tells me that that stolen painting is still within the walls of the Manhattan Museum. No. It's easy enough to get a bundle into a museum, but taking one out... Oh, you mean that once they cop the painting, they couldn't get it past the door? Yes. In the days now, they may have been keeping it in a place that they prepared for just such an emergency. But where? In the other part of the museum that this charming stranger used to hang around in. The Egyptian room. The tomb of the pharaoh. In a tomb? That's where we're going, right now. Oh, no, boss. Among the mummies at midnight? Oh, no, sir. Well, here it is, Mr. Keene. Tomb of King Mentop the Fourth. Well, thank you, Colby. This switch turns on all the lights inside. That's right. All right, you stand by at the door. Mike and I will have a look inside. Okay, Mr. Keene. Come on, Mike. Good luck. Oh, boss, there's a hundred other places I'd rather be than in an old cemetery like this. Don't worry. There's plenty of light in here. With all these narrow winding alleys. Plenty of spaces for spooks to be hiding. Here, Mike, to the left. This should lead to the central chamber and the sarcophagus of the king. The... The what, sir? A stone casket where the mummy lies. I'd like to move the lid and have a look inside. Well, I wouldn't. Relax, Mike. Here's the central chamber now. And the sarcophagus. Saints preserve it. Come now. Let's try the lid. Stand back. Don't move. Glory be. The mummies are talking. No, Mike. Mummies don't talk English. Stand back. Hands over your head. It's coming from that doorway on the other side. Quick. Let's get after him. Boss, the lights are gone out. Quick. Turn on your flashlight, Mike. Oh. Help! He's trying to strangle me. I'll fix him. Come on, you. Here, I got him, boss. I... No, no, he's broken away. Your flashlight. Turn it on. Oh, I dropped it somewhere. Here, here it is. That's better. Boss, he pretty near flashed the coat off your back. Look what he left behind on the floor, Mike. Ten-inch knife. Now we know we're up against killers. Don't just waste time. Help me move the lid of that sarcophagus. Okay, sir. You ready now? Heave! Heave! All right, Mike. Now flash the light inside. Why, boss? It's there, Mike. The painting. But we've still got to find the girl. And she's in the hands of killers. <laughs> Here you 
Now, Mr. Keene, I've narrowed the list of tempera painters down to a half dozen possibilities. These are all experienced artists, all over 40? That's right. I wish I could have stopped that fellow when he came tearing out of the tomb last night. Would have been a quicker way of finding Betty. If ever we're going to find her. Oh, never mind such talk. The next step, uh, let's find out everything we can about the six men on this list. Anything that indicates shady activities in the past. Right. And let's hurry, because now that gang is desperate. Betty? Oh, there you are. Tyler is the name. Well, whatever you call yourself, why are you keeping me in this house? When are you going to let me go? You have the painting. What more do you want? Correction, my dear. A certain busybody got it away from me last night at the museum. A Mr. Keene. Well, good for him. No. Bad for you, my dear. Why? Why? You see, I have two careers at once. Sometimes I borrow, shall we say, valuable paintings from museums with the help of my colleague, Mr. Bruno Carson, who paints excellent substitutes. Most of the time, I run a very respectable gallery on 57th Street. You're afraid that now I'll give you away. Mr. Carson is also worried. He's not always a forger, you know. Let me go, and I'll never mention this to anybody. The museum has its painting back, and that's all it cares about. Correction again. The police and that man Keene will move heaven and earth to track us down. He's a very smart old Billy Goat. I don't care. This has gone far enough. You can't keep me a prisoner here forever. That's right, my dear. See you later. Let me out. Let me out. Please, I beg you, let me out. No use. No one will hear you. Tyler. Tyler. Okay, Carson, I'm coming. Look, Tyler, we can't keep her here much longer. Some people are coming tomorrow to look at my painting. All right, Carson. She goes tonight. And don't leave any traces. There won't be, Carson. Not for the East River, right outside the door. The river? Too bad. She's so nice looking. Yes. Too bad. Well, Mr. Keene, that reduces the possibilities to two. Does this fellow have it for Jones? What trouble was he in, Colby? He once tried to swindle an estate out of a very valuable Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. Also, there was once talk of some forgery. Very promising lead. Now the other fellow. He got into a different sort of trouble. Bad checks. And his name is... Bruno Carson. I see he lives over by the East River. Yes, but have it for Jones seems more likely. The forgery angle. All right. We'll try him first. And let's go. There's no time to lose. No... Something tells me to try Carson first. I don't think Carson Why would... Why would a successful painter like he is live in a dismal place like the East River waterfront? Well, perhaps he likes to do river scenes. That's just the point. These catalogs show he's never done anything but portraits. But, Mr. Keene, the Shut other... up that phone, Colby. Get me the harbor police right away. All clear, Carson? All clear, Tyler. The cop on the beach just walked up the block. Here. Help me carry her out on the pier. She's not going to start screaming. No chance. That gag is on good and tight. She's bound hand and foot. Okay. Let's go. Straight ahead now. Onto the pier. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. We could just beat it somewhere. Run away from the cops the rest of our lives? No, sir. Okay. Okay. All right, here we are. Get ready to swing. Stop where you are. Hands up. It's that fellow Keene. Drop her, Tyler. Let's run for it. Stop where you are. I'm warning you. Mr. Keene. What is it, Colby? Look, Betty's hauling off the pier. She's fallen into the water. I'm going in after her. I hope he makes it in time. The harbor police. They've got those men. But not for murder, I hope. Wasn't Bob wonderful, the way he went in after me? You certainly owe your life to him, Betty. Yes, to a stuffed shirt. Why, Bob, whoever called you that? You did when I asked you to marry me. Oh, darling, will you ever ask me again? Well, Betty, will you marry me? 
You bet I will. Okay. Uh, Mr. Keener, I don't think we've properly thanked you. Oh, be my dear fellow. This is no time to stop to thank anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Listen next week at the same time when Mr. Keene brings us his next missing person's case. The case of the boy who used big words. Every girl and woman knows that in order to be popular today, one of the most important things she needs is an attractive smile. A smile that reveals clean and sparkling teeth. And to the man in business, teeth that make a good impression are just as important, too. If you're not certain that your own teeth are as attractive as they should be, here's something you'll want to know. The new Colonos High Polishing Toothpaste does wonders in helping to remove those dingy surface stains. Helps reveal the natural brilliance of your teeth that add so much to the charm and personality of your smile. I'll tell you why it does this. Its action on teeth is like that of a jeweler's polish on tarnished silver. So start using Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste yourself right away. You can get Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonos toothpaste at any drugstore tonight. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonos toothpaste and Mr. Keene. And this is Mr. Keene with one last word. I've been asked to bring to your attention the important fact that our country is still faced by a critical shortage of tires for civilian use. The tires you have now must last you indefinitely. Do not be misled by announcements that huge quantities of synthetic rubber are being made. They are, but they are required for military use. So do everything you can to make your tires last as long as possible. Drive only when necessary, at under 35 miles an hour. Keep your tires properly inflated and inspected. Recap your tires as soon as they need it. And share your car with others. Good night and thank you all. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, will be on the air next Thursday night at 7.30 Eastern War Time. Tomorrow night, listen to the big new musical, Friday on Broadway. All the song leaders of the day direct to you from the Gay White Way. At 7.30 tomorrow night, over most of these stations. There is now a wonderfully inexpensive, easy way to wax wood floors and linoleum to a high, sparkling finish in only six to nine minutes. Use Aero Wax, the self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy, dries without rubbing to a marvelous high luster, adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbings, yet costs only 25 cents a pint. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. This is a Columbia Broadcasting System. To save both time and money in waxing floors, use economical no-rubbing Aero Wax. Just apply it, and in six to nine minutes, it dries itself to a hard, lustrous finish that saves countless scrubbing. Makes dingy floors shine like new, yet Aero Wax costs only 25 cents a pint. Try Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous all investigator will take from his files and bring to us 
one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. But first, for bright, sparkling teeth, a million-dollar smile, try the new Kalanos toothpaste. It's a high-polishing toothpaste that acts like a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from silver. Safely, speedily, it whisks away dingy surface stains that cloud your smile and reveals the full natural brilliance of your teeth. Get the new high-polishing Kalanos at any drugstore tonight. Ask for Kalanos toothpaste. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Now for Mr. Keene and the case of the boy who used big words. Our story opens in the reception room of Mr. Keene's office as Miss Ellis talks with an unusual visitor, Jimmy Harmon, who's only 12 but wears horn-rimmed glasses and a very serious manner. Mm, young man, you say you want to see Mr. Keene at once. Yes, ma'am, I've got to. Well, he's a very busy man. I know, but the nature of my business is very imperative. Uh, important, you mean? Imperative. Mm, such big words. <laughs> What's your name? James V. Harmon, Jr. And what's yours, if I may ask? You may, and it's Miss Ellis. I like you, Miss Ellis. You have a trustworthy face. Now, now, Jimmy, you wouldn't be trying to get around me. Oh, please, Miss <laughs> Ellis. I've heard so much about Mr. Keene, and I know he's the only man who can help me. Help you with what? Well, that's very confidential. Well, he's talking at the moment with his assistant, Mike Clancy, but I'll see what we can do. Oh. Come along, Jimmy. Thank you, Miss Ellis. Oh, Mr. Keene. Yes, Miss Ellis? This young man, Jimmy Harmon, insists upon seeing you. Good morning, Jimmy. Good morning, Mr. Keene. I'm afraid I'm rather busy. Mm, I know, but he says the nature of his business is very imperative. Imperative? What in tarnation is that, I should like? Come over, Jimmy. Sit down. Mr. Keene, you're a gentleman. Thank you. Yeah, guess you won't be needing me. Suppose I introduce you to my assistant, Mike Clancy. I'm pleased to meet you. I've heard about you too, Mr. Clancy. Very reliable, they say. Well, thank you, my boy. Now, Jimmy, you haven't come here because any member of your family has disappeared, have you? No, Mr. Keene. Just the opposite. We can't get rid of him. Of whom? Well, of my uncle, Bill Harmon. Your father's brother? That's right. You see, Mr. Keene, he came to visit us, oh, approximately six months ago. You mean about six months ago? Approximately. Well, Uncle Bill was only supposed to stay for a week or two, but he's been staying on and on. What I don't like, well, the very first night he sat down in the parlor in the nice, big, soft chair that's always been father's. I went up to him, and I said, Uncle Bill, that's where father always sits. Yeah. Well, he works very hard, and he needs that chair to relax in. Yeah. Don't you think you ought to get up? Hey, Jimmy, why don't you just go and chase yourself? Well, have your parents objected, Jimmy? You can't object with a man like Uncle Bill. And something more, Mr. Keene. Yes? His eyes are too close together, and he doesn't have much back to his head. Oh, really? Yes, I made a study of that. It's a sign of bad character. Now take Mr. Clancy's skull. Miss he... Dow, I thank you to leave my skull alone. Well, I only wanted to see that your skull shows signs of excellent character. Oh, well, now, that's different. Jimmy, this is all very interesting, but... Wait, uh... Mr. Keene. There's something more. Well? I mean the man in black. What man in black? Well, I was walking on Fifth Avenue one day with Uncle Bill when this individual suddenly came out of a side street. Black suit... Black derby and black overcoat. He walked up to Uncle Bill and said... Well, hello, Harmon. Huh? Fancy meeting you. Oh, uh, uh, hello. Didn't ever expect to run into me again, did you? Look, I, uh, I, I can explain everything. No, I don't think you can. I, I, I swear, the, the way it happened... It happened the wrong way for you, Harmon. Wait a minute. I can square myself. I can... Taxi! Hey, taxi! Come on, Jimmy! Hop into that cab. And so your uncle suddenly ran away from this man in black, eh? Yes, Mr. Keene. And now I have a feeling that something terrible is going to happen. 
You've got to help me get Uncle Bill out of our house. Jimmy, did your parents know you were coming here to see me? Well, no, sir. I didn't tell them. I'm afraid I don't really have any right to interfere. Well, this is a dangerous situation, Mr. King. Well, the kid's been to too many movies, boss. Mr. Clancy, I resent that remark. I may be only 12 years old, but I'm not a child. Oh, sure, sure. Well, Mr. King? Jimmy... Much as I understand your dislike for your Uncle Bill, I'm afraid this is a matter for your parents to handle. But, Mr. King... I hope you'll drop in again someday when I have a little more time. Will you do that? All right, Mr. King. But I know something is going to happen. Something terrible. <laughs> Mr. Keene, now if you'll just sign those letters. Letters? Oh, yes, yes. Mm, You're so absent-minded today. Something bothering you? I've been thinking about the visit we had yesterday from that strange little boy. Jimmy Harmon? Oh, he was just scaring himself. Jimmy has a wisdom and perception far beyond his years. Mm, Imagination, too. (laughs) Now, here are the letters. Pen, ink. Boss. Mr. King. Hello, Mike. Why so excited? Well, I bought myself an evening paper on the way to the office here. And the first item that hits me, I sense preservers. Well, come, Mike. Let's see it. There. There, in the bottom of page one. Read it, sir. Man killed in auto accident. Boy vanishes. Good heavens, that doesn't Police mean... Police were left baffled today by an obvious hit-and-run accident early last night on Madison Avenue, which claimed the life of William Harmon, 44, of 3000 East 89th Street where he was staying at the home of a brother. The dead man, found lying in the roadway, had gone walking with his young nephew, James Harmon, Jr., age 12. But there has been no sign of the boy since the accident. Police are investigating. Heavens above! Hand me my hat and coat, Mike. I must talk to Jimmy's parents at once. Yes, Mr. Keene. We knew Jimmy admired you, but we didn't know he'd been to see you. He didn't tell you, Mrs. Harmon? No, Mr. Keene. He always used to say that if anybody ever disappeared, you'd be sure to find him. Well, Mr. Harmon, more than ever, I hope I can justify Jimmy's faith in me. He's a splendid boy. So serious and so good. A sweet little owl. The way I blame myself for this. As I've told you, Jimmy had certain premonitions. Well, I don't know that that had anything to do with it. We talked to a Lieutenant Walker... Of the Missing Persons Bureau? Yes. He's an old friend of mine. What was his theory? Just a hit-and-run case. And he thinks that maybe Jimmy became unnerved at the sight of blood and ran away. Or else... We hate to think of it. Or else that Jimmy was also hurt and the driver maybe took him to some hospital and left him there. What do you think, Mr. Keene? I need more facts. Now, what can you tell me about your brother, Mr. Harmon? Well... Bill is my brother, and I don't like talking bad of the dead. He moved in six months ago and just wouldn't move out again. What was his occupation? Occupation? I wouldn't much know. I hadn't seen him in ten years. Business, he said. He talked about big deals sometimes. He said he'd made a lot of money out west. Mm -hmm. What was he supposed to be doing in New York? Looking for some opportunity to invest. And that's all you know? I wish we could do something more to help you, Mr. Keene. You're so kind to drop everything like this and go hunting for Jimmy. To me, it's the most important case of my life. Well, I'll have to go now. The Missing Persons Bureau is my next stop. Thank you, Mr. Keenan. God bless you. See, Lieutenant Walker, it just happened the boy came to my office yesterday to tell me that strange story. Well, I certainly appreciate the tip, Mr. Keene. It makes it more than just a hit-and-run accident. I'm very much afraid so. You don't mind my stepping into the case, Lieutenant? No, no. Glad to have you. About the boy, I presume you're in touch with all the hospitals? Yes, it's still possible he was also hurt. The driver was soft-hearted enough to want to get him to a doctor. Yes. There weren't any witnesses to the accident or whatever it was? No, no one. No, excuse me. Lieutenant Walker speaking. Oh, yeah, Martin. You got a pretty good set of prints? What's that? I'll be darned. 
Yeah. Well, thanks anyhow. Bad news, Lieutenant? Funny news, Mr. Keene. I was a man at the morgue. <laughs> Jeepers, there are two billion people in the world, and they all got fingerprints. Now, just when it would help to know... This man has no fingerprints? Not a trace. You mean his fingertips have been mutilated? Yep, the old gag. All ten fingers badly burned and healed over with scars. Yes, that is news. Well, clear as day. He was an old mobster, did it deliberately to cover up his record. Well, maybe he did once have an accident. No, 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 no. no he belonged to a mob. One way or another, we're up against a stone wall. Even his own brother knows nothing about him. Well, Mr. Keene, only one thing left to do. Send out a nationwide alarm for the kid, Jimmy. So, if you'll excuse me now... I'm running along anyhow. No fingerprints. Who was he, anyhow? What was he hiding? And so the case takes a baffling turn for Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons. Meanwhile... Thousands of girls who suffer the heartache of being unpopular, clever, pretty, smartly dressed girls, have just one thing to blame, teeth that rob them of charm when they smile. Thousands of men whose livelihood depends on selling themselves to others have the same weakness of appearance to blame. They don't know it or notice it, but the people they contact do. You may or may not be one of those people, but if you have the slightest suspicion that you are, try the new Colonos toothpaste, a high-polishing toothpaste. You'll find Colonos helps remove those dingy, unattractive surface stains from your teeth. Brings out all the natural luster and brilliance that adds so much to your smile. Start using the new Colonos tonight. Remember, it's a high-polishing toothpaste. You can get Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonos toothpaste at any drugstore. Now back to Mr. Keene as he returns once more to the home of Jimmy's parents. See, Mr. Harmon, Mrs. Harmon, the one important thing right now is to get back in the dead man's past. Well, I've shown you every blessed thing that was in his room, Mr. Keene. Not one single paper there to give us a lead. One moment. Do you recall anybody who may have phoned him regularly? Well, well now come to think of it. Yes, Mrs. Harmon. The, the one person I ever knew Bill to have anything to do with, it, it was last week. Uh, Mr. Benson phoned him here two or three times. Benson? Any idea who he was? No. no. Or where he might be reached? See, I, I remember once that Bill wasn't in, and, and Mr. Benson left a message where to call him back. Where? Try to remember. It may be very uh, important. A hotel it was. It's a funny name, like, like that man in England. What man? Uh, Lord somebody. He it has to do with rationing. It was the only way I remembered. Oh, Wilton? Uh, that's it. The Hotel Wilton. <laughs> Say you're looking for Mr. Ben. That's right, clerk. You wouldn't have his first name. I'm afraid not. All I know is that he was registered here last week. Hmm. I looked through these files. Yes, we had a Harley Ben. Hmm. Good. Is he still in the hotel? No, checked out yesterday. Yesterday. All the bad luck. Did he leave any home address with you? Uh, just Chicago. That's a very big city. Of course, there's just a chance he might be in the Chicago telephone book. But you'll find the out-of-town phone books on the end of the counter there. Thank you. Find it, sir? Yes, here it is. Thank you. Phone. What? Benson. Any luck, sir? No. No. No Harley Benson. I rather imagine he wouldn't be in the phone book anyhow. Oh, sir, if there's anything more I can do, I'll Yes, be... there is. You keep records, of course, of all long-distance phone calls for your guests? Oh, yes. Would you mind showing me Benson's? To explain my right to ask, my name is Keene. I'm a tracer of lost person. I'm now looking for a 12-year-old boy, Jimmy Harmon, who has disappeared. Oh, yes, I read all about it in the papers. Let me see. The bill file's right here, Mr. Keene. Yes. Yes, Benson. He made several calls. Did he call Chicago? Yes, sir. Three times. His only long-distance call. And the number he phoned? Here you are, sir. 
The same all three times. Thank you, clerk. That's all I need to know. Well, here we are, boss. This is the house that Benson phoned to from New York. Didn't expect this. It's as pretty a cottage as I've ever seen. Well, I've known gangsters to hide out in stranger places. All right. Strike a match now, Mike. Let's see the name on the doorbell. Says Malcolm Dugan. That's an alias. I'm sure it's Benson. And that Benson is that man in black that Jimmy talked about. Possibly. Well, let's bust right in and face it. Hey, you out there. Anything you want? Well, you see, we... Yeah, I seen you through the window, prowling around in the dark. Indeed you did, Benson. How'd you know my name? That's a long story. I've come all the way from New York to talk with you. Though I didn't expect to find you under the name of Dugan. Dugan's a cousin of mine. I board here. May we come in? Sure. Why not? Now then. My name is Keene. Say, not the detective. That's right. This is my assistant, Mike Clancy. Okay. What's next? What do you know about Bill Harmon? Bill Harmon? A gunman, huh? Trigger man for one of the Chicago mobs. Alky racket. Or was it dope? Or maybe black market? And you did him in. Oh, wait a minute, Clancy. Back up. All right. Tell us in your own way. Harmon ain't no mobster. He was the same as what I still am. And what's that? A prison guard in the Lakeshore Penitentiary. A prison guard? Sure, until five years ago when he quit. I didn't hear a word from him until I was in New York on vacation last week and ran into him on the street. On the street? You get that, boss? One second, Mike. Benson... Are you in the habit of wearing black suits and overcoats? Me? <laughs> you think I'm an undertaker? <laughs> well, now, when you ran into Harmon, did he tell you what he was doing? Well, the salesman, he said. We had a couple of beers together two or three times. He didn't talk much. Tell me, was there any special reason why he left his job at the penitentiary? No, just quit. What were his duties? Same as me, guarding the death house. And... Come to think of it... Yes? There was something a little funny in his quitting. He did it just a couple of hours before that big racketeer, Legs Mosley, was burned. Mosley? Oh, yes. And Harmon just walked out. Said he had enough executions. Well, it happens that way sometimes with a guard. Yes, I've heard. But now I remember something else. The minute Legs came out for his last walk to the chair, he asked for Harmon. Where's Harmon, he says. he's He's got to be here. He's always here. I said Harmon had a previous appointment. So Legs kept asking for him. Yeah, Mr. Keene. Think it meant anything? Hmm. Tell me something else, Benson. Are there any members of the old Mosley mob still in the penitentiary that I could talk to? No, not a one. Tell you what, though. There is a guy in the pen, a lifer, who was supposed to burn the same night with Mosley. He got reprieved to life. His name is Rayburn. Like to talk to him? You bet I would. The first thing tomorrow morning. Rayburn, I gather you're no gangster. No, Mr. King. I committed my murder over a woman. Well, as I've told you, I'm trying my best to trace a fine 12-year-old boy who's disappeared. Somehow the trail re leads right here to the penitentiary. How do you mean? It's too long a story to tell right now. There's only one question I want to ask. Yes, sir? Why did Bill Harmon suddenly quit his job as a guard in the death house a few hours before Mosley's execution? Well, you see... And why didn't Harmon have the nerve to go into the death chamber that night to see him executed? Mr. Keene, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Well, don't worry about that. Harmon is dead. The question now is to try to save the life of an innocent boy. Well, why did Harmon quit? Well, because... Because he welched on a bargain. Welched? How? Well, while Lex Mosley was waiting to burn, some of his gang reached Bill Harmon and made a proposition. They would pay him 20 grand if he would help spring Lex from the death house. The brains of the plan was a fellow called Blackie. Blackie? Well, they called him that because he always dressed in black. Blackie Westley. Yes, go right on. Well, the way I got the story, Harmon agreed. But he wanted some of the money in advance. 
So they gave him $10,000, and he would get the rest after Legs was over the wall and free. I knew all about it because they were going to let me walk out the same time. But Harmon never carried out his crooked bargain. No, Mr. King. Talk of crooks out crooking each other. He took the ten grand and beat it. Legs died in the chair. I got a reprieve. But that's ancient history, isn't it? Yes, ancient history that suddenly came back to life. Thank you, Raven. Why, sure, boss, it's as plain as day now. Blackie Westlake and the other members of the old mob killed Harmon for revenge. Yes, and abducted Jimmy because he had once seen Blackie before and was in a position to identify him to the police. Right. Now the next step. We phone Lieutenant Walker in New York and ask him to send out an alarm. For every member of the old Mosley mob? No, Mike. Just for Blackie Westlake. And why just for Blackie? To start a civil war. Boss, I, I don't get it. You know the old saying, when thieves fall out, honest men get their due? Mike, that's the only way of getting Jimmy safely out of the hands of those gangsters. Oh, psychology stuff. Right. Let's phone Walker now and then get back to New York. they call Blackie. Next on that hoodlum stuff. Well, that's what you are? When are you going to let me out of the cellar? When I feel like it. Get back there, I'll slap you. That's better. Look, Four Eyes, I brought your sandwich out of the kindness of my heart. I don't want your sandwich. Why are you keeping me here? Because you're too darn smart, Professor. You saw us bump off your dear, dear uncle. I'll let you go. The cops will take you to headquarters. You'd identify my picture. Just what I thought. You're one of those habitual criminals. Shut up. I'm told that from the shape of your ears and the index of your cranium. Stop that highbrow stuff. My cranium's all right. Where is this place you're keeping me? A warehouse. And a lot nearer your home place than you think. I'm sick of it. It's cold. Let me out of here. Just stay right here till the noise dies down. Now go on. Get back. Get back and I'll smack you. Take your hand off me. Let me go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you slapped me right in the face. You locked my glasses off. And that's only a sample. Let me out of here. Let me go. Little wise guy. Hey, Blackie. Blackie. Yeah, Montana? Look at here. I was just outside and got a newspaper. So what? Me and the others are scramming out of here. Why? Look at this paper. The front page. Let me see. Oh. Blackie Westlake hunted and murdered an abduction. That means you. I thought I was covered up the whole way. You ain't, but we are. Now, now, wait a minute. You're Mark. hot, Blackie, hot as fire. The whole town's looking for you. So the rest of us is taking the car and scramming. Because we're still in the clear. Uh, you're not walking out on me. You're staying right here. If we burn, we burn together. Not in your life, Blackie. Okay, maybe this will teach you. Oh, you rat! Larry French, come quick! Oh, so you want to shoot it out, huh? It just, it just makes me sick to think of Jimmy in the hands of those gangsters. He's a bright boy, Mrs. Harmon. We can count on him handling himself intelligently. And besides, Mother, the police are hunting everywhere. Yes, but they might take weeks and still not find him. I'm sorry, Mrs. Harmon. I've done my best. Now it's only a question of letting nature take its course. Nature? But, Mr. Keene, those men are killers. That's exactly what I'm counting on. You see... Oh, the door. Now, go and see. Just remain calm, Mother. Oh, everybody. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, thank God you're back again. Jimmy, my oh, darling. Oh, Mother. Hello, Dad. Oh, darling, did those men hurt you? Are you all right? We're just a little hungry. Relax, everybody. Oh, Jimmy, we were just about crazy with worry. Where were you? In a warehouse in Brooklyn. Well, how did you ever get away from there? In a police car. Thanks to Mr. Keene. I guess you'd like to know what happened, Mr. Keene. Yes, Jimmy, I certainly would. Well, just about an hour ago, I was locked in the cellar. But I heard an argument start. The rest of the gang wanted to run away without Blackie. Suddenly, they were shooting all over the place. When the police came a little later, they were all dead or dying. 
I'd like to kill Kenny Cap. Good heavens. You see, Mr. Keene, they didn't have much loyalty to each other. Yes, Jimmy, that's exactly what I was counting on. Mr. Keene, Lieutenant Walker told me how you did it while he was driving me back. Psychology, that's what you call it. Whatever it was, Mr. Keene. You saved Jimmy's life. How can we ever thank you? My own happiness is reward enough. Mr. Keene, there was something I wished to request of you. Yes. What's that? Well, when I go up, may I have a position in your organization? Well, Jimmy, I never had a higher compliment from anybody. Of course you may. <laughs> Listen next week at the same time when Mr. Keene brings us the fascinating case of Mr. Trevor's Secret. Today, the girl, a woman who wants to be popular, knows that one of her most important assets is a charming smile and teeth that sparkle and gleam knows that no matter how smartly she may dress or make up, teeth that are dingy and discolored looking instantly create an unfavorable impression. And the same is true of the man in business, whose very livelihood depends on selling himself. He knows how quickly discolored looking teeth can bring failure. That's why today thousands of smart and successful men and women are changing to the new Colonos, high-polishing toothpaste. So for your own sake, try the new Colonos toothpaste yourself. It works like a jeweler's polish on tarnished silver. It helps remove dull, dingy surface stains, revealing the natural brilliance and sparkle of your teeth. Ask for Kalanos Toothpaste, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, at your drugstore tonight. You've been listening to Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keen next Thursday night when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of Mr. Trevor's secret. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colin O's Toothpaste and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over most of these stations tomorrow night.